Welcome to the AP Econ 2020 semester review for macroeconomics. And we're, today we're covering Unit 4, which is uh, covering chapters 29, 30, and 31. So let's kick it off with chapter 29. We're looking at fiscal policy. We'll start by some uh, talking about some automatic stabilizers. Uh, this is non-discretionary fiscal policy. Uh, the whole idea here is that... Um, the government doesn't need to step in and actually pass a law and get the president to sign it, that kind of thing. These are automatic uh, stabilizers. So they're working to uh, counteract the cyclicality of, of a recession. Uh, if the um, GDP is falling, uh, you see real GDP actually in negative territory leading to recession or in recession. Um, the idea here is that um, consumers would have a less, uh, a lower tax burden as a result of less GDP because uh, maybe they got laid off, so uh, they're not impacted by the um, by the burden uh, of the tax, but also it's because they may have lost their job or they may have had to take a pay cut or something like that. If GDP increases, the tax burden also increases, uh, which obviously is going to discourage consumption and, and over-the-top spending, uh, which would, would hit AD, aggregate demand, uh, would be impacted by that. So that is a, a role that it plays there. So the idea is, you know, think of it as progressive. Uh, the more you make, the more they take. Uh, if you're not making anything, they're not taking anything. And the more you make, uh, obviously, the more they would be, uh, they would be taking out of your paycheck and that kind of thing. So, um, Essentially, these are automatic stabilizers, so the idea here is legislation uh, wouldn't necessarily need to be taken in order to make this happen. Now, obviously, we can see with the stimulus package of the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a lot of things uh, taking shape there in terms of trying to um, promote um, AD and get the economy moving. Uh, trying to encourage that growth. And we'll see in the coming days how that plays out. Uh, but the concern is um, that uh, that is a little different. That's definitely not an automatic stabilizer here in terms of making that happen, uh, which is uh, thus the non-discretionary aspects of fiscal policy. Okay, so if we go back to uh, GDP and, and calculating how we look at GDP, remember it's consumer spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus uh, the net exports or the exports minus the imports. Uh, when we look at fiscal policy, we're looking at uh, how government is using that, that spending uh, in terms of uh, the purchases of goods and services uh, to impact the aggregate demand curve. Uh, so that's really all uh, the, the government uh, purchases is, is impacting here. Now, cutting taxes is going to help uh, consumer and investment spending. Remember, investment spending is by businesses. It's not uh, investment like stocks and bonds. It's investment like um, business is investing in uh, capital resources and, and innovation and technology kind of to try and move out the PPC, shift it outward. Um, so all of these things impacting the aggregate demand curve. So if government cuts taxes, obviously that encourages C&I growth here, consumer and investment spending. If government is purchasing more, uh, again, barring the crowding out effect, the idea here is that government uh, spending is going to help improve GDP as well. Uh, and obviously, both of those would, would help with the uh, shift in the aggregate demand curve as a result. And net exports obviously helping along those lines. So to close a recessionary gap, expansionary fiscal policy, essentially uh, starting at 81 here at equilibrium or E1, um, with that... Uh, that that uh, spending that we just talked about, uh, this is shifting the aggregate demand curve, uh, and that would lead it to a higher price level, but uh, full employment. Uh, the idea is shifting recessionary gap or negative output gap back to full employment, back to the long run aggregate supply. And uh, this is going to close the recessionary gap, may lead to a higher price level, but you're definitely um, uh, decreasing the unemployment uh, that you have in the recessionary gap. So unemployment falls, prices may rise, not too concerned about that yet in terms of that inflation uh, at bay, uh, because you've got more people working, and that is always a good thing. Now, in uh, closing an inflationary gap or a positive output gap, uh, again, Cutting back on that spending that we talked about earlier is going to shift AD to the left, uh, closing the inflationary gap or the positive output gap, leading us back to uh, long run or full employment at E2. Uh, so unemployment 
uh, is essentially uh, coming back to full employment. So think about long run uh, is full employment. Uh, so um, price levels are falling, unemployment not a problem. Uh, we're, we're pretty good there in closing out that inflationary gap and ending up back at, at uh, full employment at long run. Uh, so this is how we would use that fiscal policy um, here, here is where you would tax more and spend less. Uh, in the previous example, uh, the recessionary gap, you're going to uh, tax less and spend more uh, in order to encourage that aggregate demand shift. Keep in mind, fiscal policy has a lag. Uh, there is a gap here, and it does take time. Even those stimulus checks that they're sending out uh, by President Trump uh, are, are going to take time in order to take effect. So it's not like it just happens overnight. People are getting those checks. Uh, they're paying down their credit cards. There's a lot of leakage in that circular flow uh, because people are paying off their debt. Uh, they're putting some away in savings. Uh, there's a lot of other places it may be going in addition to um, going out and spending it as it will. But remember, the multiplier effect uh, is at work here. So, you know, when they say they're spending $2 trillion, multiply that by the multiplier. Um, and you get a much greater effect than just $2 trillion. So you can see how much money is being spent in the economy and the multiplier effect, which you know John Q. Public isn't really paying attention to, uh, but it really does have an impact because if that multiplier is five, we're talking $10 trillion, uh, two-thirds of our overall GDP uh, that's being uh, essentially impacted uh, by the multiplier. That can be significant in terms of, uh, in terms of growth and, and, and the shifting the aggregate demand. But but also keep in mind, $10 trillion uh, in a $16 trillion economy can also have an impact on inflation. Uh, so, so stay tuned for that because uh, that may be also at work here. Uh, than just uh, than just having an impact on on the uh, aggregate demand. And again, how do you get the multiplier using the formula one over one minus MPC or one over MPS uh, is essentially going to get you there. And remember, the mu the multiplier, the spending multiplier, is always going to be greater than the tax multiplier. Always. Um, even by just a little, but spending multiplier always is going to be greater than the tax multiplier, so take that one to the bank. Now, uh, in terms of those automatic stabilizers we were talking about, obviously um, some uh, the, of those automatic stabilizers are going to reduce the size of the multiplier. So um, people are getting checks, uh, they're, they're using that money in order to pay bills, pay their rent, pay their mortgage, um, and, uh, and, and keep things afloat. There's some leakage there too. They're going to be pay, paying down their credit cards, uh, they're paying on other resources. They're not spending all of that money in the economy. So the automatic stabilizers uh, is really important here because the impact here is uh, kind of reducing the size of the multiplier. And again, multiplier is still greater than the tax multiplier uh, in terms of the spending multiplier, but the idea is an automatic stabilizer uh, can reduce its effects. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so the question always remains, are deficits a good thing? Are surpluses a bad thing? Um, and you know, you ask 10 economists, you get 20 different answers, uh, but the idea is the same, uh, that there are times when Keynesian schools of thought spending in order to get us out of a recession is a really good uh, approach. And there are times when, um, when more of the Milton Friedman or the supply side uh, approach is different. You know, get government out of the way and let government, let uh, business do its thing and, and we'll see a lot more growth as a result of that. So, uh, so there are two sides to every coin and uh, no different here when it comes to balancing the budget. Um, in terms of the overall spending of the government, keep in mind uh, where do they get the money from. This is tax revenue uh, that's coming in, uh, taking out the government purchases and taking out transfer for payments. And essentially, the spending of the government is always going to be, or at least in um, present day times, is negative. Uh, it's, we're going to run a, a deficit. Uh, we're going to add that to the national debt. Uh, overall, uh, that much larger debt, which is what, around $22, $23 trillion, and uh, probably more after all of this. But the idea is the same in that that spending by the government uh, usually tends to be a negative number, usually is, uh, is, is as, as a result of that. Now, ex um, in terms of using this uh, fiscal policy to balance the budget, obviously in expansionary fiscal policy, you're going to... Um, you're going to uh, make the, a budget surplus smaller or a budget deficit uh, bigger because you're trying to grow uh, out of a recessionary gap. Uh, a contractionary fiscal policy is going to be trying to close an inflationary one or a positive output gap. Uh, so again, different... Uh, different uses for this expansionary fiscal policy if you're trying to um, um, 
expand the economy to get out of a recessionary gap, you're going to cut taxes and raise spending. Contractionary policy, you're going to increase taxes and cut spending as a result of that. Uh, but but the uh, uh, the impact is the same in terms of uh, what impact uh, can it have overall in terms of helping to grow or slow the economy down uh, is that uh, spending, that spending multiplier is going to be greater than the tax multiplier. And also, so if they're cutting taxes or they're raising taxes, um, they're spending more, uh, the spending is always going to have a greater multiplier as a result. So keep that in mind. And it's always cyclically adjusted uh, in terms of uh, these times. I mean, think about it in terms of in a recession, we're going to spend more. Why? Because it's a recessionary period. It is a cycle in which um, we are in a recession versus uh, in in an inflationary period or expansionary period. Um, and you can see with the uh, kind of the purple columns here where recessions have taken place, uh, where um, additional uh, budget deficits were necessary in order to help grow us out of an economy, uh, out of a recessionary economy. Um, and uh, here's a good example. Uh, look in the early 80s where you saw a lot of deficit spending. Why? Uh, because they we're worried about that recession uh, and uh, less worried about inflation in those aspects, more worried about unemployment uh, and uh, especially leading into a 1984 election uh, that that would have uh, been taking place. So uh, in, always important to look at it in terms of cyclically adjusted. Why? Because it does tend to mirror those recessionary periods, uh, and the budget deficit is going to go up in recessionary times. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't even be thinking a year ago of spending two trillion dollars today uh, in fiscal spending uh, had had we not even thought about this, you know, pandemic taking place. Uh, but the fact that they're spending that uh, and more um, in terms of uh, what's out there, um, this is a, this is a direct correlation to the the business cycle to the uh, recessionary period you may be in. So cyclically adjusted, the actual budget deficit, you can see there's a lot of mirroring going on, uh, but the idea is the same. Uh, we're going to spend our way out of an economy. We're going to cut back on those expenses when we're in a positive output gap or an inflationary gap as a result. And again, we could debate this one uh, six ways to Sunday on should the budget be balanced or not. The idea is the same. Uh, can you argue a particular point and use expansionary or contractionary policy in order to close those output gaps, uh, either a negative or a positive one as a result? And then uh, obviously any additional deficits that are um, long term that you, we can't cut, re recover at the end of the year would be added to the national debt or the public debt that you see there. Now that does have a crowding out effect as we know. Um, and um, and as a result of that can crowd out business investment. Uh, they're competing for resources with government spending and different departments and agencies that are spending that money. So as a result of that, it may be crowding out uh, the opportunity for business to push out the PPC. That could slow the growth rate uh, of the, the PPC as a result of that. And then uh, in extreme case, we haven't seen that uh, because obviously the last thing you want to do is default on your debt. Um, but that could be an economic disaster. Uh, definitely financial turmoil well as a result of that, and that's why you don't see that happening. As long as we can uh, pay the interest payments on that debt, uh, we'll continue to be fine in terms of um, uh, paying for those, uh, those, those deficits that come in each year. It's when uh, you can't uh, that that would be problematic because obviously interest rates would go through the roof. Nobody would want to continue to borrow, let you borrow money. And that's where it gets into this idea of the debt to GDP ratio, looking at um, what is our debt to our overall GDP? We've got a debt, what, 22, 23 trillion dollars versus GDP of about 16 trillion. Um, so a little higher, uh, than, than what it used to be, kind of a one to one ratio. We, there are other countries that are much greater than that, but the idea is the same. You want to try and moderate your budget in order to meet, um, uh, those those uh, requirements, but who wants to run, as we talked about this before, who wants to run on an election uh, year and say, hey, I want to I want to raise your taxes and cut government spending uh, so that we can get our budget balanced and in order. Uh, people don't necessarily win on that particular platform, and we definitely don't see that playing out. Okay, so let's move on to Chapter 30, where we kind of talk about the Fed and, and money, and as we start to look at the money supply. Uh, so again, money, any asset you can use to buy goods and services, uh, currency and circulation is essentially the cash that's out there. Checkable bank deposits is any money uh, on which I can write a check. And then the money supply is all of these assets or anything 
in the economy that we can consider to be money. Now, why do we like money? Because it's a medium of exchange. I don't have to carry products and services around with me and offer those. I can use money in place of that. And now, even today, I can use digital money. Uh, I can use Apple Pay. I can use ePay, eWallet, uh, lots of different aspects uh, of that in, in, in place of money. Uh, but it is a nice store of value. It is also important in that it um, uh, is a unit of account. It's also uh, easily divisible. Uh, it's also durable. Uh, there are lots of aspects to uh, why we use money over a lot of other things. Now, uh, tracing the history of money, we see commodity money was kind of used as a medium of exchange because it actually had value itself. It was a gold coin that was actually worth something. That made a big difference uh, for people who were uh, walking around with this cash uh, because you could essentially melt it down. It was worth the value of what it uh, said it was. Uh, if it was a dollar or it was $10, it was worth particularly that. Now, um, what we see is uh, people aren't walking around with, you know, hundreds of dollars of gold uh, that could weigh you down, not necessarily be as transportable as, it, as uh, we would like. So that's where we move to the commodity-backed money in terms of that medium of exchange, uh, meaning uh, this silver certificate that you see here is backed by $10 in silver in some uh, in some fort like Fort Knox somewhere and the idea was if you ever wanted to exchange the silver certificate you could do so for the actual ten dollars in silver uh, for that money it actually had uh, value by way of the uh, by way of the the the, the um, product silver or gold uh, that was backed up in a vault somewhere now today what do we have we have fiat money which is the idea that um, it is only backed by the full faith and credit of the united states government and really by nothing else um, that it has no in, in intrinsic value of its own it you can't exchange it uh, the the paper that it's written on isn't worth any more um, than uh, than uh, any ordinary paper the difference is that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the united states government that is going to pay you in whatever denominations that is worth and so you can buy goods and services based on that now monetary aggregate or the overall measure of the money supply uh, the um uh, the College Board is liking uh, to use this term called the monetary base, essentially the overall measure of the money supply. And uh, the Fed then would use uh, the uh, buying bonds or selling bonds to change that monetary base. Um, it doesn't mean that banks are going to loan out that money, but the idea is the same in terms of that. And then near money is something that can be easily uh, converted uh, into assets, uh, liquidated, if you will, uh, into actual M1 or money that can be uh, used as a medium of exchange. So converting that to cash, if it's an M2, maybe it's a mutual fund or something, uh, you can convert it to an M1 and uh, very easily in a day or so convert it to cash that then I can use to pay bills or something along those lines. Okay, so uh, looking at this idea of the monetary aggregate or the monetary base, um, the idea is that we have a lot of money in M1 uh, and uh, M2 also includes M1, so it's going to be even greater. Uh, and we continue to see an increase of the money supply, the monetary base, as a result of currency in circulation, uh, the money that's in bank deposits, traveler's checks, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see um, that over time, that continues to increase as we push out our production possibilities, as our GDP continues to grow, our monetary aggregate or our monetary base will continue to grow as well. Um, and in terms of what we see here, M3 is more institutional money. M2 is things that uh, aren't as easy to convert into cash, uh, such as a money market fund and what you would see there. And then, uh, or, or other types of assets that you would have to sell in order to convert them uh, into um, into M1 or cash, uh, but you have the ability to be able to do that. Uh, a bank is obviously the financial intermediary in terms of making this happen. Now, they do have to keep a certain amount of money on hand, which is the reserve requirement or bank reserves that we see there. And then that reserve ratio is uh, what they would hold in reserves. So if the reserve was 10%, and that would be really, really high today. Uh, but if it was 10%, that means of a million dollars, 100,000 would have to be kept in the bank, 10% at all times, in order to uh, prevent a bank run, uh, which uh, is this idea that uh, we saw back in the, the 1930s. It was uh, 
in a film, It's a Wonderful Life, in which people were basically uh, going to banks and, and trying to get as much money as they could out uh, because they were worried the bank was going to fail and they weren't going to get any money out. A lot of those banks closed and they never reopened. People lost everything. So uh, that's where the uh, bank reserves came in through the Securities Act of 1933, which basically called for these reserve requirements and for banks uh, to get a deposit insurance. Uh, so that they're backed by the um, FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, which is uh, funded and backed by the United States government, uh, basically to keep those types of banks from failing and and uh, uh, consumers, uh, depositors, actually losing everything that they had in the bank, which uh, obviously uh, contributed to the Great Depression. And uh, is just horrible in that respect. Um, and as I said, deposit insurance um, is what the uh, banks had to have on hand. Now, this does create a moral hazard. Um, can banks take more risks when they know that hey, I've got a, I've got deposit insurance, and there's a government agency that's going to bail me out if I, um, if I mess up? Uh, so there is a moral hazard involved in doing that. And we've seen over the years companies like Savings and Loans uh, that were bailed out back in the 80s. Uh, as part of the uh, the Keating scandal, um, and uh, and and so there there is a back and forth in terms of regulate, deregulate, regulate, deregulate uh, with deposits uh, and banks as a result of this. Uh, but again, um, Congress uh, holds hearings in order to keep an eye on on the FDIC and other institutions look, who are looking and managing uh, and, and basically. Uh, 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 examining uh, what banks are doing and what what kinds of uh, uh, loans they're making and the assets that they're guaranteeing as a result of the loans that they're making. So, uh, kind of an interesting phenomenon. But but the idea here is to try and uh, keep banks uh, on the up and up so that they don't go under like we saw in the the Great Depression. Okay. Uh, in terms of assets and liabilities, let's look at a, a T account for a second. So remember, um, when the bank gets deposits. Uh, those deposits are liabilities because essentially you owe that money back to whoever the depositor is. If it's a business, if it's a consumer, uh, whoever it is, uh, the bank has that as a liability. So that's why you see deposits listed as liabilities uh, because it's a liability on the bank. Now, um, they can take that money and then loan it out and that would be an asset to the bank because they could call in that loan and get that money pretty easily. But notice here, reserves, in this case, there's a 10% reserve. Uh, so 100000 would have to be kept in the bank, uh, that's an asset, but it's not money that they can loan out. Now, let me caveat that with they can loan it out if they're going to borrow based on um, the uh, the discount rate or the discount window um, in order to meet those reserve requirements. They can do that, but that gets a little more complicated and doesn't show up on the T account. Uh, but it is something that banks can do if they're trying to loan out significant amounts of money, and as a result of that, they um, uh, they fall below that reserve requirement. They can borrow money at the discount window from the Fed or other banks in order to meet that reserve requirement and then pay it back. Uh, but but traditionally, they like to have some type of reserves on hand so that they don't have to pay uh, additional interest on those uh, payments for the discount rate. Because I mean, even though it is a discount, it is still um, it is still money that they're paying on money uh, that they're they're uh, borrowing in order to meet their reserve requirement. Uh, which is what we uh, see here. So regulators uh, require owners of banks uh, have these assets and uh, the assets uh, for a bank that are over and above its liabilities is called the capital uh, or capital requirements as a result of what we see here. The important thing to note in this is anything that you have uh, beyond uh, your reserves or, or what your liabilities are would be a part of your capital. Okay, so going back to this idea of um, of assets, if you had um, if you you had a, a number of uh, of of the uh, capital here that you had more assets than you had liabilities, and it was beyond the reserves, uh, that would be a, a capital a, a requirement or a capital asset that you would have on hand. Uh, so. Um, that is um, that's something that that uh, a bank would have here and the idea behind it is if the bank is doing that uh, as an investor i would look at the bank and go why haven't you loaned out that money why are you holding on to it when you could be out there earning you know three four five ten percent whatever it is uh in terms of making that so um you don't see as much of this excess uh in the bank's accounts because obviously 
Uh, they want to loan it out in order to make more money off of the money that they have. Uh, reserve requirements, as I mentioned, 10% um, is a, an easy number for us to look at in terms of deposits, uh, but um, usually the number that we see today is much lower than that uh, because banks aren't held to quite that high a standard. But it gives you the idea of the 10% reserve requirement is kind of a minimum in terms of what they have to keep on hand. That's the money they have to keep in the vault at all times in terms of uh, trying to uh, meet the requirement of the bank run problem that we talked about during the Great Depression. So uh, if there's $1,000 in circulation, uh, there's $1,000 in the money supply. So Silas uh, is going to keep his money under the bed. Now, if he de decides to deposit this cash in the First Street Bank and they're going to loan $900 out to Mary, uh, that all of a sudden uh, is another $1,000 bank deposit and $900 uh, in circulation. Uh, that they're lending out to Mary. So as a result, we've we've essentially expanded the money supply by $1,900 by loaning out this cash to uh, Mary in addition to Silas. Uh, so out of that $1,000 initial, we've already created $1,900 in money. Uh, this is how banks create money. Now remember what I said about the monetary base. The Fed is creating the monetary base, but if the the banks aren't loaning out the money, uh, then then we're not we're not expanding the monetary base uh, by what we could be doing. Uh, and con thus contributing to the multiplier, uh, what we talked about, the spending multiplier. Uh, so if they're not doing that, if banks aren't making those loans uh, or their requirements are so high that, that they're not uh, able to, uh, 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 consumers or uh, businesses aren't able to meet those with standards, uh, then you're not growing this money supply. Uh, even though the monetary base is larger, uh, the money supply isn't growing because um, there's a problem in, in banks being stingy with uh, being able to loan out that, that money, and that is a problem. Uh, but in this case, uh, we've loaned out money to Mary, and Mary has deposited her money into the, the account. Uh, as a result of this, we've created 1900 in in the money supply. And so that money goes back into the, um, into the bank, of which uh, they have to keep... Uh, Again, 10% on hand, so $810 then can be loaned out to uh, another institution, and essentially we've created $2,700 out of that initial $1,000. So we only have $1,000 on hand uh, in terms of what's out there, uh, and the idea is that we only have to keep, what, $190 on hand, but we've already created $2,710 uh, in the money supply as a result of that $1,000 deposit. And you can see how quickly uh, this will add up, or, or essentially uh, add up in terms of the uh, reserve requirements here and the money multiplier, uh, not to be confused with the spending multiplier, but the idea of bank uh, banks creating money is essentially 1 over RR. So the simplified version of this is just 1 over RR, so in this case the RR is uh, reserve requirement and that is 10 percent so 1 over 0.1 uh, in this case would be a multiplier of 10 so if we had a thousand dollars we could have up to and including ten thousand dollars created in the money supply if we took this all the way out to you know 10 12 13 stages whatever the case may be all of that because of that one thousand uh, dollars that that silas uh, decided instead of keeping under his bed he was going to put in the bank uh, so uh, so as a result of this um, the idea here is you have the monetary base, the sum of your currency circulation and your bank reserves, everything that's out there uh, that the Fed has essentially bought bonds or sold bonds in order to create. And then the multiplier is that uh, money creation that we see uh, added to the, the um, monetary base uh, as a result of that. So um, when you are looking at... Um, when you're looking at this over time uh, and that idea of the uh, 1 over RR, you can see a significant amount that, that is uh, going to be added here uh, as a result. Um, so the, uh, the money multiplier can definitely create a lot of cash very quickly in terms of, uh, in terms of the overall approach that it can take uh, to increasing the money supply uh, just by banks loaning out money uh, that they don't have to keep on hand. Okay, so the, uh, let's talk about the Fed for a second, because we're going to get into a lot more detail here in, in when we get into Chapter 31, but uh, the Fed is essentially the, the national bank. It is the central bank. Um, 
that uh, oversees all of the banks, all of the uh, lending institutions out there, uh, and basically takes a look at how they're spending, how they're loaning out money, how they're making loans, and basically regulating them as a result. Now, they control the monetary base, as you can imagine, so they can buy bonds and uh, help grow the economy by taking uh, and creating money um, uh, in that monetary base that then... Um, that then with the money multiplier, the banks can loan out and, and create more money in the money supply. Um, they can also sell bonds uh, and take money out of the money supply as a result of that and, and, and reduce the size of the monetary base. So um, it's really important there uh, that you see the Fed really controls a significant portion of the economy uh, through uh, their buying and, and selling of bonds, the bird strategy, right? Bonds, interest rates, reserve requirements, and discount rate. That is essentially their four tools in their, in their toolbox to help grow or slow, excuse me, to help grow or slow the economy. Uh, so by targeting this federal funds rate, uh, looking at the uh, federal funds market, uh, essentially uh, looking at um, do they buy bonds, sell bonds, do they increase interest rates, cut interest rates, do they increase the um, the reserve requirements, uh, do they cut the discount rate that, that the Fed is charging for banks to borrow from other banks or to borrow from the Fed. Um, all of these things are, are part of BIRD, this idea of bonds, interest rates, reserve requirements, and the discount rate that essentially allow the Fed uh, to uh, adjust the size of the monetary base and then uh, encouraging lending institutions, banks, and other savings and loans and other types of financial intermediaries uh, to essentially help increase the money supply uh, or cut the money supply, as depending on which way they're going here, to close an inflationary gap or a positive outp output gap, or to um, uh, to close a recessionary gap or a negative output gap. So the Fed has a lot of power here in terms of uh, in terms of what they're doing. This is the the monetary policy side, and we'll get into that as we launch into our final chapter of this unit, which is uh, Chapter 31. So we start by talking about money demand. Uh, this is the relationship between uh, the money that's demanded, and that's going to be based on the interest rate. Uh, the higher the interest rate, the less money that is demanded as a result. I mean, think about it. Uh, if an interest rate is higher, you're not going to want to borrow money if the interest rate's higher, uh, and definitely less so than it would be if the money uh, that you demand is at a lower interest rate. So d money demand is going to increase greatly when the interest rate is lower. Uh, it is going to, uh, the money demand is going to fall off and decrease as the interest rate rises. Uh, so that's this liquidity preference model that we see here based on the interest rate um, in, in, in that respect. Um, if we look at how this curve would shift uh, in terms of the um, uh, the aggregate price level shifting the money demand curve to the right, uh, it's going to be based on three criteria. That's real aggregate spending uh, increases significantly. Uh, we have a change in technology. Uh, the idea is uh, technology changes and therefore we don't need as much money. Uh, think about this in terms of um, Apple um, Apple Pay or uh, e-wallet or other types of, uh, of uh, online or um, electronic uh, payment systems uh, that changes the technology that can shift the money demand curve inward uh, or leftward as a result of that we don't need as much cash uh, so that will um, that will shift the money demand curve inward or leftward and the last one is change in institutions and that's really regulatory requirements how does government uh, change the institutions of, of what types of things are out there and how we need cash so um, by uh, lifting the uh, parameters or deregulating industries so they can do more electronic payments that would help us in terms of being able to uh, use uh, electronic payments and not need money as much as a result of this. So we would see a leftward shift there as well. Uh, when we see real aggregate spending is when um, technology breaks down or uh, we see um, real aggregate spending, especially around holidays when people go out and spend because they're going out to the mall and they're shopping and they're spending more money uh, or they're going out uh, on vacation and they're taking more money. Uh, those types of seasonal or cyclical aspects uh, can lead to a shift in the money demand curve uh, outward or rightward uh, but that's essentially uh, what we see with the liquidity preference model now it's important to also note uh, that GDP is impacted by what we call the velocity of money uh, and this is the idea of how money turns over uh, is essentially uh, contributing to uh, this idea of um, 
growth in the economy. So if we look at uh, the velocity of money in terms of if I go to Giant and I spend $20, then that $20 uh, gets turned around and paid to um, the, the flower delivery guy who then gets um, a sandwich at Subway, who uh, then the $20 gets paid in, in, in um, change uh, to, to uh, go and... Um, and get their shoes shined and and so we see the velocity of money the money turning over is uh, contributing to a lot greater real GDP uh, because uh, the idea there is people are using that money uh, in a way that is um, growing the economy and so it is um, it is an equation uh, I like the equation of MV equals PQ because it's kind of simpler that way so if we look at uh, M as your um, as your money and V is the velocity of that money uh, and it is equal uh, the velocity of that money is equal uh, to the uh, price and quantity uh, in an economy we can see that when real GDP is growing uh, we will have um, a velocity of money <clears throat> oh, excuse me a velocity of money and the money demanded that is greater uh, and hopefully the it's the quantity that increases not the price otherwise you have inflationary pressures uh, but as a result of that velocity of money increasing uh, we don't need as much money demanded we can use more of the velocity of money and that contributes to a greater quantity and can help grow GDP as a result of what we see here so uh, very important MV equals PQ uh, the velocity of money equals the price and the quantity contributing to real GDP and real aggregate spending okay so uh, so the relationship here to interest rates uh, obviously that liquidity preference model is leading to um, a, a greater interest rate uh, if we if we need uh, more money as a result of this uh, and and uh, the curve is shifting it can lead to a higher interest rate or a lower one but if more money is being demanded uh, and the curve shifts uh, that can lead to a higher interest rate versus um, and uh, a greater nominal quantity of money uh, versus if we need less of that cash uh, then obviously the interest rates uh, would probably be dropping as a result of that uh, and and definitely um, has an impact there so the money supply curve then uh, the is going to show the nominal quantity of money uh, with various interest rates and that's what we're going to see in the money market graph uh, that we'll look at now so uh, in this capacity we're looking at the um, nominal interest rate and in and the nominal quantity of money uh, so the uh, money supply is essentially this vertical line because it is impacted by the Fed and the Fed only Congress and the president have no impact on the money supply money supply moves to the left if they're um, going to sell bonds to slow the economy down they're taking money out of the monetary base uh, or move it to the right and uh, grow the economy by buying bonds uh, and and putting more money into the monetary base, encouraging more growth in uh, in money creation as a result of lens, institutions lending out cash. So what's that going to do? Well, on this money demand curve, if they're buying bonds to grow the economy and the money supply mer moves uh, to the right, that's going to lead to a, a lower interest rate as a result of more money uh, being out there and money demand moves along the curve. If the they're going to sell bonds to slow the economy down, that's going to cut the money supply. Uh, and the idea here is that the money supply moves uh, to MH, for instance. And as a result of this, you have, um, you have a, a higher interest rate because you have less money less nominal quantity of money that is out there and so uh, in order to use that money you're going to pay a higher interest rate as a result of that so that leads to uh, this key graph in which we look at uh, the money market account that we see here uh, the money market graph and the money supply is that vertical line the quantity of money unchanged uh, in this particular model uh, we see that uh, the money demand curve is downward sloping because at a higher interest rate we demand less at a lower interest rate we would demand more uh, and um, interest rates uh, definitely being impacted by uh, the money the changes in the money supply but also uh, the changes in money demand if that were to shift um, left or, or rightward as a result of that so in this model we see the increase 
increase in the money supply, as I mentioned, uh, money demand moving along the curve to a lower interest rate, but a greater, greater nominal quantity of money. And uh, as a result of this, it's pushing down the interest rate. So uh, the, the Fed buying bonds is actually, by buying those bonds, expanding the monetary base through an open market purchase of securities or treasuries, whatever you want to call them. Uh, this leads to money demand moving along the curve to a lower interest rate, greater nominal quantity of money, more money out there in the economy to encourage people to spend, but it's at a lower rate uh, that this is happening. And that leads to uh, this key graph in which the money supply is expanded, uh, expanding the monetary base uh, by um, by buying bonds to grow the economy. Uh, it, it increases the money supply and the nominal quantity of money, uh, lowering the interest rate because money demand moves along the curve. With more money out there, uh, you're going to pay a lower interest rate as a result of it. Uh, so this is helping to grow the economy and to... Um, and probably close a recessionary gap as a result of that. Okay, so uh, to push the interest rate up, we would do the opposite, which is sell to slow. So selling bonds uh, on the open market or having a sale of those securities uh, is going to take money out of the economy. The Fed collects that cash um, and takes it out of the monetary base. Uh, the idea here is that sale of bonds is going to um, tighten the money supply. So a nominal quantity of money is much smaller here, leading to a higher interest rate. It's going to drive up the interest rate as a result of this. And that is what we see here in this money market graph. The money supply being tightened and money demand moving along the curve to a higher interest rate and a smaller quantity of money. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, the liquidity preference model showed us that there are three ways that we can shift the money demand curve. Uh, this is through uh, real aggregate spending that increases. Uh, this is through changes in technology and changes in institutions. So in this capacity, we see uh, that a... Um, uh, maybe it's a breakdown in, in institutions or whatnot that shifts the money demand curve to the right. Or as I mentioned, it, it's cyclical in that real aggregate spending increases in the summertime because people need more cash because they're going on vacation. Uh, maybe they're you know, going on a cruise or they're going on... Um, uh, to, to uh, foreign countries in order to, and they don't know what kind of cash they'll need. Uh, so having that money on hand uh, essentially is driving up the rate. Uh, the money demand curve shifting outward or rightward, uh, and when households are deciding to spend more of that cash, it's going to lead to a higher interest rate as a result. Now, um, what we are seeing more today is uh, that people are uh, needing less cash on hand. Uh, they're deciding to save it, not to spend it. Uh, that also impacts loanable funds, by the way, because it increases the amount of loanable funds that banks have uh, to borrow money. Uh, but the important piece here is that this money demand moving inward is going to lead to a lower interest rate as a result of that shift. Uh, and that um, is going to um, lead to a lower interest rate that then people will be more inclined to want to borrow at that particular capacity. So expanding the monetary policy uh, is this idea of increasing aggregate demand. Um, with expansionary policy, you're trying to grow out of a recession. Uh, so b buying bonds to grow the economy would be expansionary here in terms of that monetary policy. Uh, and then contractionary is selling bonds. Uh, buy to grow, sell to slow. Uh, selling bonds to slow the economy down would be contractionary in that it's reducing aggregate demand, taking money out of the money supply, thus shifting AD to the left. And as a result of that, uh, less money out in the market, less uh, money uh, chasing uh, those goods that are out there, and that's slowing the economy down. That's more in an inflationary gap or a positive output gap you're trying to close to bring uh, up, uh, bring the economy back to full employment, back to long-run aggregate supply. Okay, and uh, it's important to note uh, that in the all of this that's happening in monetary policy is in the short run, uh, because in the long run, uh, the changes that are happening here in the money supply, once we get back to the long run, uh, there's no impact. Uh, the idea is uh, monetary policy is what we call monetarily neutral. Um, it doesn't really have an effect on the economy uh, in the long run. But in the short run, uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes said this, right? In the long run, we're all dead. Um, but in the short run, we still got to pay our bills, we got to pay our mortgages and feed our families. Uh, and that is the important aspect of this monetary uh, policy is that most of what is happening here is happening in the short run. So that's important to note. All right. Well, hopefully you found this helpful as this closes out Unit 4, uh, looking at Chapters 29, 30, and 31. Live the 5. Uh, coming up next, we have Unit 5, covering Chapters 32 and 33, as we close out this year's AP Macro Review. Have a great day, live the five, and we'll see you in Unit 5.